Our guest today, Professor Jenny Sorkin, is Associate Professor of History of Art and Architecture at UCSB. And thank you to all your students for being here. <laughs> and um, she writes on the intersection between gender, material, culture, and contemporary art, working primarily on women artists and underrepresented underrepresented media. Jenny is the author of Life Form, Women, Ceramics, and Community from 2016, which examines the confluence of gender, artistic labor, and the history of post-war ceramics. She received her PhD in the history of art from Yale, Yale in 2010, and she is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Modern Craft. Sorkin re received fellowships from the American Council of Learned Societies, 2014-15, the Center for Crafts in 2012, the Getty Research Institute, 2010-11, and the ACLS Luce Fellowship in American Art in 2008. Thank you for being here, and thank you Welcome. for coming. Thanks so much to all the uh, recent and current UCSB students who came out for this. It's nice to see so many of you in the room. Um, this is going to be a, a kind of brief history or overview of ceramics in Southern California. It's a very um, overlooked medium uh, that doesn't get a lot of historical reception. Um, People always want to know how ceramics is made. It's the first question anyone asks is, how did you make that? Um, and that's never the kind of question that's applied to painters or sculptors. Uh, it's a kind of medium that's been mired in technique and expertise um, in terms of its reception and history. And so I'm here to do a little uh, recouping to sort of give you the overview of how this medium has um, what some of the debates are, what some of the um, gender politics are, and um, also to introduce you to some of the major figures. Um, so my book, Live Form, Women's Ceramics and Community, is a kind of reworking of uh, the traditional history, which is really male-centric. Um, some of you have heard of Peter Volkus. He's maybe the most famous post-war American potter. Um, in, in the United States, and he worked in Southern California. But this is a book that really um, takes the medium of ceramics and makes it um, into a history that's about performativity um, and process instead of about the actual object and technique. So I'm not concerned with object or technique. I'm, I don't care what cone people fire at. Um, I'm not a techie, and I don't make ceramics. That's, that's also one of the quick, the, the sort of obvious questions people often ask me when they say, what do you work on? And I say, craft history. Uh, and they say, oh, what do you make? And it's actually, I make history. I, I don't make things. Um, and uh, I do have an art background. I do have a BFA um, in fiber. And uh, my secret is that I have I ended up writing the first book on ceramics. Uh, but I don't actually like the feel of ceramics um, or clay on my hands. I'm a little OCD about that, and that's why I also don't like to bake, because it reminds me of flour and that dry feeling. Um, so one of the, the major figures in the book is Marguerite Wildenhain, who you see here, who is a Bauhaus-trained potter, um, who trained at the Weimar Bauhaus. She's the only woman to have ever received a Master Potter certification. Um, and she has to flee because she's Jewish um, by descent, and she goes to the Netherlands, and then she ends up in Northern California. Um, and she establishes a pottery um, that you see the building here called Pond Farm, um, and she trains students for 30 years between about 1950 to about 1980 um, in how to throw um, and learn to make ceramics as you would have at the Bauhaus. Um, and so she starts students with an introductory dish. They can't graduate to the next form until she tells them they can. And this continues all the way up to the teapot. Um, but what she does that's really amazing um, is that she doesn't let anybody fire anything. And nobody takes anything home. Um, which would be really hard for anybody today to understand in that you know we have 
all kinds of, um, I don't remember what it's called, but where you paint and you drink at the same time. Uh, and it's all about taking the thing home with you. Uh, that wouldn't fly today, but in mid-century it did, and students were there to learn process and form, um, and they never took home anything, and she never fired anything for them. Um, and the idea was literally to make your hands have a muscle memory in forming works um, so that your mind doesn't have to think about it. You're just, you learn to do it, almost like a gymnast or an athlete. Um, and what you see here is her working on a kick wheel. Um, these were the traditional European wheels. Um, they're not electric. You literally kick them um, to make the wheel go. Uh, this is the, her work. Um, it's a piece that's at LACMA. Um, I really love this form. Uh, it's, she's, a, she's a more traditional potter. She worked in stoneware and earthenware. Uh, but what I really love about this one is that there's a really simple geometric um, additional addition problem here. So this is two plus three equals these five bars. Um, and that's how the base widens. And I think it's, a, it's simple and beautiful and a kind of built-in geometry to her process um, many times. Uh, another potter that I cover in this book is Susan Peterson, um, who is, um, has really fallen off the radar for the most part. She taught at the University of Southern California between 55 and 71. She's teaching simultaneously um, to Peter Volkus, who's teaching um, at, at Otis. Um, she's the person, though, who sets up the program at Chouinard and then also at Hunter. She's the first person to train Ken Price, who then defects to Peter Volkus. Uh, but what I recover in my book project is actually this amazing public television access show that she does before PBS exists. And it's a how-to show, and it's called Wheels, Kilns, and Clay. It's from 1964 and 65. It runs the duration of that year on um, sort of uh, KNXT Channel 2 television in LA. Um, and she made this kind of kitchen demo situation with an apron and a smile on her face that's based largely on the kind of um, uh, kitchen setup of Julia Child is what she was looking at um, in terms of thinking about the relationships between ceramics and the various stages in the process in which you have to bake clay and it bisques um, before you fire it. And so she would bring things in in stages. It was a 30 minute show. I think of it as a, a prelim show to like the Food Network um, in that sense. So she's showing people forms. She gets LACMA to lend her um, objects from their collection that she shows um, on, you know, in, in process. She goes and does an episode in Sweden at a ceramics factory. Um, unfortunately, the show never takes off or goes into syndication, but it's, um, for me, a kind of proto-feminist form that comes 10 years before feminist video art. Um, and sort of at the, in, in this moment of a media landscape in which people think public television is gonna change the world. Um, and she's doing this teaching on television. Um, so this kind of process-based demonstration, what we would call a ceramics demonstration, is really key to my whole project. Um, and it's really the kind of pedagogical or educational um, moment that's most important in studying ceramics is watching a kind of master artist demonstrate their forms, demonstrate in front of you. Um, here's a picture of Karen Carnes, um, who I went and took a class with. This is the only ceramics class I've ever taken. This was really just so she would talk to me. Um, and it worked. Uh, but you can see people sort of taking pictures around her and filming, and they knew that they were in the presence of this kind of greatness. Um, and she was, you know, very elderly at this point, um, 10 years off from dying, although nobody knew it at the time. Um, and she's making forms and demonstrating her, her process, her formal um, ways of working for a student audience. And that's largely the way many ceramics artists have historically trained students is to work within or alongside in the classroom, um, which is very different than life drawing, it's different than sculpture. Um, it's a kind of working within situation that is not, it's hierarchical in terms of the demonstration, but then everybody goes to their own wheel or their own station and tries to do something similar and the artist comes around the room. Um, 
So just to show you that I, I continue to write and think about ceramics um, when people ask me to do so. I'm probably moving on in some of my projects, but most recently um, I wrote for the Annabeth Rosen um, catalog, which is uh, traveling right now and is at the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco. It originated in Houston. Um, I just wrote a brochure text for um, Newcomb Pottery, which was the only women's pottery um, set up in the South um, from 1895 to 1940. Uh, and this will, I was really proud of this particular text because it will go to all the libraries in Louisiana and the state, which is really fantastic. They have an amazing collection. Um, and I also work on other artistic um, forms, particularly sculpture. Um, and I curated this show in 2016 with Paul Schimmel called Revolution in the Making. Um, abstract sculpture by women. And while there were not um, ceramic artists per se in this show, many of the processes that craft artists used resonated for me within many of the forms um, that came through. The, maybe the most craft-based person in the room uh, that you see in the back here is Ruth Asawa, um, who did a kind of crochet technique in her um, hanging uh, wire forms. So to think about studio pottery um, and to try to put Brian Rochefort in context um, is to think really across the 20th century. Um, and also to start with the concept of what actually is studio pottery, which is different than commercial pottery. Um, it's a term that's used when the craftsperson controls the process start to finish um, entirely by his or her own hand in literally the studio. Um, people make functional work, people also make non-functional work. Historically, there's been a tension between functional and non-functional, but in fact, most people made both all the time. And that has to do with literally supporting oneself. It is always easy to sell um, a mug or a plate or a teapot or a cup because people use those objects. People aren't able to use sculptural objects in the same way. Um, and so there's always a marketplace for cookware and tableware, um, unlike sculptural vessels or large-scale non-functional sculptural works. Um, one of the, the sort of sad facts of teaching at UCSB is that I have um, amazing um, MFA students, but we do not have craft, per se, as departments. Um, so this is just to show you, for those of you who don't know, that um, the last remaining crafts at UCSB, pottery and weaving, and I'm showing you the recreation catalog um, from UCSB where you can go take um, a jiu-jitsu class or jump rope for fitness, that's where pottery and weaving has been demoted. Um, it is now a recreation. Um, on UCSB's campus, it is housed literally at the gym, um, and it is, uh, people take it in a kind of therapeutic way. Um, they take it for fun. Um, and so it is demoting these media that have been most closely associated with women um, and taking them out of the art department and putting them or housing them at the gym alongside the climbing wall um, or, you know, a cardio certification or capoeira or something like that. So um, there has not been a ceramic artist on the faculty at UCSB um, since Michael Arntz retired in 2003. Um, and this is his work. He's still here. Um, I honestly have not met him, um, but I know he's here in town somewhere. Um, and I did want to tell you from the very beginning of the century, Santa Barbara has a long, illustrious ceramics history um, in that Frederick Curtin Reed lived here briefly. Um, he was an arts and crafts potter um, who lived and worked in Santa Barbara between 1913 and 1917. Um, and like many of the artists, a whole century later, it's not just a little ironic to me that he could not make a go of it here. He found it too expensive. <laughs> um, so uh, artists at the turn of the last century were having the same problems that the artists at the turn of this century are having. It's not a particularly friendly atmosphere for emerging artists or artists who hope to set up and stay. Um, Reed was briefly on the faculty of the Santa Barbara Normal School, which is the technical school that precedes UCSB by several generations. Um, and this really beautiful 
beautiful vase that he did of a cypress tree and a kind of glowing sunset with a body of water um, is from his time in Santa Barbara. It's really the only vase that still exists from this era that anybody can date. Um, and it's in the Metropolitan Museum's collection, which is pretty exciting. Um, and they often have it on permanent view. Um, if you go to the American wing, it's um, down in the area by the Frank Lloyd Wright um, room that's permanently installed. Um, Reed was not just an arts and crafts potter, he was also a commercial designer, um, kind of way ahead of his game. He studies um, with his father as an apprentice um, in an old school apprentice system in Staffordshire, England. He ends up emigrating to the US. Um, he spends a lot of time jumping around, um, but the center of the pottery universe is in East Liverpool, Ohio. Um, and he goes back and forth between um, the commercial work that he does for industry there, and then he tries to make it literally as a studio potter here in Santa Barbara, and that doesn't work out. Um, he ends up moving up north and um, working within a therapeutic pottery called Arequipa, um, which housed tuberculosis patients, um, which is, I, I think he's had a great sort of fantastically diverse career. Part of it had to do with income and just trying to figure out how to be scrappy and get by. Um, and then toward the end of his life, he really hits the jackpot with um, this line that many of you will recognize immediately called Fiesta Ware. Um, and so he's the designer of Fiesta Ware, which is still being marketed today. I think you can still buy it at Macy's. Target might have a knockoff version of Fiesta Ware now. Uh, but um, this is Frederick Reed's sort of crowning achievement um, during the Great Depression and he dies in 1942. But this is the sort of last big line he does um, for Homer Laughlin China Company, which is again in this kind of very industrial part um, of uh, Eastern Ohio near um, West Virginia. Um, but immigrants have always been really crucial to establishing ceramics in this country and particularly throughout Southern California. So we can think of Reed certainly as an immigrant who was here to forge a new path and maybe make his fortune um, in ceramics. Unfortunately, he himself never made any money off this line, which is what happens to many people um, when they design something fantastic, but it continues to live on and has become a classic um, ongoing design that keeps being remade um, and, and remarketed and um, the other set of um, fantastic uh, ceramic artists who came to this country and fled um, as uh, Jewish refugees, as immigrants, um, sort of, they kind of saw the writing on the wall and left Vienna in 1938. Um, they had trained at the really important academy, the Wiener Werkstatt, um, and this was the um, couple, Gertrude and Otto Knoxler, who worked collectively together in which Gertrude threw these really delicate, thin-walled vessels, and Otto was the glaze chemist. He had a chemistry background, he was a tinkerer, he was really interested in trying to um, figure out what kinds of glazes would overflow, what would be volcanic, what would crystallize. Um, and you see from this early point, this is a, a rather sort of middle career one from 65, but you see that the glaze drips. Nobody's interested in sort of covering the whole surface. It's about kind of pouring, allowing um, the glaze to have its own gravity um, down to the end of the bottle um, and allow it to sort of pool um, at the surface. And that's something that I think that we see even in the present work here, that there's this kind of investment in dripping, in process, in pooling, um, in a kind of painterly um, relationship to glaze or ooze, we might say. Um, and Otto and Gertrude were really uh, crucial in teaching the medium. They never taught formally, um, but you can see with this volcanic glaze here in which it literally bubbles over and explodes in the kiln. Once again, you see the kind of ooze and drip on the inside of the pot as well as the outside, and it makes these beautiful textures that are incredibly tactile to behold and also hold. It makes you want to touch. Um, and that's one of the sort of major attributes of ceramics 
that I think is very different than this being just painterly and kind of eye candy, but that there's a real tactility to the medium um, that's about having a physical relationship with the object, not just a visual one. Um, so the Knoxlers worked together until Gertrude dies of cancer in 1971, and they make thousands and thousands of pots together. And then um, Otto has to learn to throw um, on his own later. Um, and it is them as a couple that disseminate the use of the kick wheel, which I'm showing you here. This is this um, object that you saw Marguerite Wildenhain on. It's mechanical, it's not electric. Um, and believe it or not, in 38, when they arrived in Southern California, nobody was using a wheel to make works at all. Nobody knew how to use a wheel. Nobody had been introduced to a wheel. So the wheel is actually introduced by them. Um, nobody knows how to throw at a wheel. They know how to coil, and it's a rather primitive um, technique, not primitive in the sense that it's, it's a historic, ongoing thousand years of um, indigenous techniques of coiling, but it's not Eurocentric in the sense that you form a pot by the rotation that you're creating with your feet. Um, and it's only later that the electric wheel gets introduced. So just to give you a couple other terms here, um, another term um, that comes to us from this era of discovery is the clay body, which is the composition of clay, so all clays are not created equal. Um, many of the clays that you get at like the elementary school or the community level um, have reground bits into them um, from sort of things that have been fired. It's called grog. Um, it's like the most basic clay you can make and it's just reforming and using what's around. But many of the clay ingredients include ash, felspar, quartz, silica. There's this wide spectrum of colors, white, black, red, gray. Um, and the key reason for mixing your own clay is for plasticity, for porous, uh, porosity, for pliability. So most professional ceramic artists mix their own clay and they have a particular clay body that they make, um, that they become sort of known for using, um, whether it's stoneware, whether it's earthenware, um, and you order it in these huge bags and then you mix things yourself. So it's also an incredibly physical medium in the sense that you really have to be up for schlepping, you know, big 25, 45 pound bags of clay and um, pushing them together and pushing them into what's called a pug mill in order to mix and um, make a kind of dough, if you will, um, out of this material. So it's a really, um, and this is why people become really technically savvy in this medium, is you really have to know what these glaze chemistries do um, once you put them onto your clay body. Um, you also have to not just know how to mix clay, you also have to know something about chemistry. Um, and people would often, and still do to this day, keep chemistry notebooks um, in terms of notating the kinds of formulas they've used. So it turns out to be an incredibly mathematical, scientific, engineering um, savvy kind of medium. Um, I think more so than any other contemporary art medium, this is the one that attracts um, a lot of people really highly invested in precision and technical expertise um, in a way that you don't see necessarily painters, you can correct me, but, um, and painters do mix their own paints, but, and people do stretch their own canvases, but there's a sort of wide swath of um, uh, engineering that happens between building a kiln, firing a kiln, making a glaze recipe. Um, and so all that becomes um, a kind of uh, important thing to learn how to do yourself. And there wasn't a lot of knowledge here where people were learning largely by trial and error and from each other. So the earliest programs in the area are in Los Angeles. Um, they are simultaneously established um, by Laura Andresen, who's one of the few female teachers um, for a really long-term period of time, who teaches at UCLA. She's 
She goes to UCLA. Um, a fun fact about her is that she's an open lesbian um, who lives with a female partner during an era when that's not socially acceptable. Um, and she teaches at UCLA until 71. Simultaneously, on the other side of the city at University of Southern California is Glenn Lukens, who establishes the USC program also in 33, but leaves by 50. Um, and you can see here that this is a, an unknown date um, in Lachman's collection, but I would wager that this is um, when she's working without a, a a wheel. She doesn't know how to use a wheel. And the way she learns to use a wheel, um, this is a lovely picture that Imogene Cunningham took, is through her work with the Knotzlers. They teach her how to use a wheel. And so she's, the, she's one of their students who says, I'm teaching Clay. I don't know how to throw on a wheel. Can you teach me? And they generously say, of course, we'll teach you. So there's a real generosity of spirit um, among the small community that's um, forging ahead in um, LA. Uh, Laura Andresen's most famous or best known student is Martha Longnecker, who um, her name might not ring a bell to you. She's a San Diego potter uh, who taught for many years at San Diego State. But she's also the founder of the Mingay International Museum in the middle of Balboa Park, which is devoted to folk art and anonymous artisan craft from around the world. Um, and that's something that she picks up uh, through her studies in ceramics, is this devotion to um, folk artistry and the, the anonymity of making work historically, that you don't need to sign your name, and that this is a museum that's um, dedicated to making work in that spirit. Um, the other artist who studies with the Knotzlers is our own Beatrice Wood, who I'm going to claim as uh, somewhat Santa Barbara adjacent because she was in Ojai for a lot of her life. Uh, and Beatrice Wood knew how and learned how to throw on a wheel. She didn't need that lesson from them, but she did not know how to make um, the kinds of blazes that she wished to see on her pots. Um, she made a lot of footed works that look very similar to the Knotzlers. Um, Otto Knotzler helps her learn, how, helps her craft a luster blaze that becomes her signature kind of look and feel to her work. She makes these luster blazes that look almost metallic um, and have this fusion of coppery gold colors to them. And then there's a falling out. Um, why is there a falling out? Because of these guardedness of blaze chemistries. And at some point, um, the Knotzlers feel that she's copied or stolen a recipe from them, um, and they stop speaking. Uh, Beatrice Wood goes on to make many beautiful vessels over a very long and distinguished career. Um, she makes these objects that are clearly not for use. They are showpieces. Um, she does throw parties occasionally with these beautiful goblets and chalices that look almost medieval. Um, and there is still a Beatrice Wood Center for the Arts um, here in Ojai that you can go see her studio. Um, and she also really becomes a better potter the older she gets. She starts out kind of a dilettante in many ways. Um, she was a kind of Marcel Duchamp groupie. Um, she is part of a salon um, that the Arnsbergs have, and she dabbles in painting, uh, and she hangs out with cool people, and she's an actress for a while, um, and she publishes this kind of fantastical biography called I Shock Myself, the autobiography of Beatrice Wood, which turns a lot of heads in the mid-80s because She's sort of giving the dish on Duchamp and whether or not, she's very coy about whether or not she's a lover of his and Kabia's or whether they're all just friends. Um, and it's a little bit um, titillating and exciting for people to read this and think about her life in relation to these very famous avant-garde um, painters. Uh, I happen to really like this ceramic work from the 90s called Career Women, which is uh, three little nude girls standing um, on a kind of fat businessman type. Um, so I feel like this is a kind of feminist statement that she garners late in life. Um, she also becomes, um, or she becomes sort of the centerpiece for James Cameron thinking about the old woman figure in the Titanic. This is good pop culture trivia. 
uh, that I feel I must share. Um, and James Cameron went to visit her in Ojai um, toward the end of her life. You see them talking, and this is an image with Gloria Stewart, who plays a version of her in the film. Um, but this sort of life trajectory of Rose, um, the, the famous um, Kate Winslet figure, is loosely based on Beatrice Wood and her um, early erotic life and her early bohemian chic world. Um, and then you watch the Beatrice Wood-like figure <laughs> release um, the famous diamond into the ocean. Uh, so just to go back to, we talked about Andresen, but I did want to sort of tour you through Lukens' path. Um, this is a New York Times article from 1943 announcing um, that there's a relationship to thinking about clay works in relation to war production because there's a metal shortage, that it's possible that clay will become a good um, uh, production line for cookware and that this could be the next commercial boom um, and that it might happen at USC is the idea. Um, Lukens was pretty self-taught. Um, he was an amazing glaze chemist. He makes these things that we call crackle glazes in which the surfaces break up once you fire them. He would go digging for minerals himself in the desert. It's a kind of proto hippie back to the land thing that he's doing in the 30s and in the 40s. Um, and he ends up with these brilliant colors um, that are just gorgeous. Um, the problem with them is, is that when you use certain kinds of metals and particularly lead glazes, you can't eat off anything with a lead glaze. So they become um, showpieces, ultimately. Um, Lupin's also is um, an important writer of the era. Um, he's always sort of writing articles for popular ceramics, and he's always chasing um, this fugitive Egyptian copper blue glaze that he's trying to recreate from the ancient world. Um, so he's kind of a polymath, and he's got his own thing going at USC. He also has Raphael Soriano, who's um, a famous uh, Jewish-Italian architect who flees um, also from the war, um, make him an amazing international style house um, that was just sort of rescued and designated a cultural monument in 2007. Um, I, I think it's privately owned. I don't know if you can go in, but I did want to show this to you. This is in the West Adams neighborhood, which at the time um, had these beautiful modernist homes and was quite fancy and fairly adjacent to USC. Um, and is now once again having a kind of revival. Uh, Lukens' most famous underknown student, or unknown to people in the ceramics world at least, was actually Frank Gehry. Uh, Frank Gehry studied with Lukens, and later in life um, he's become one of the primary Lukens collectors. Uh, he's gone and driven up all the prices of Lukens' spare uh, leftover. There's not much that you could buy. Um, and he's got them. Um, another artist who I just want to throw in here who is actually um, a copper metal artist, she's not a ceramicist at all, but I couldn't help myself looking at the Frank Gehry, um, is June Schwartz, who's based in the Bay Area and also makes vessels um, in other ways and not in ceramics, out of mesh, copper mesh um, and electroplated metal, really thin metal that she's um, putting in these baths um, and uh, shocking them in some way. It's, it's an electric process. I can't really explain it to you. I have seen it done, but I don't quite understand it. But this is to say that vessel work is happening in other media too. It's not just in ceramics, and we often forget about that. Um, but this looks really Frank Gehry-like to me, and I kind of love them, so I'm throwing them in. Um, the artist who's maybe most famous to this era, who I started out talking about, was Peter, Peter Volkus. So Peter Volkus, is the artist who starts out, he's a child of Greek immigrants, he studies at Montana State um, with a woman who teaches him um, everything she knows about clay. Her name is Frances Senska, she's a badass uh, Navy veteran and lesbian um, who uh, manages to go study herself with Marguerite Wildenhain and learns everything she knows about clay from Wildenhain, brings it back and starts a ceramics program at Montana State that Peter Volkus attends um, along with his friend Rudy Audio. 
Um, and then they both, uh, Rudy stays, but Peter Volkus departs for Southern California. Eventually he, he, he stops at Mills College and gets an MFA, and then he moves down to SoCal and gets a teaching job um, at Otis. Um, and uh, what I love about this is his kind of shirtless masculinity here, in which he really loves being shirtless and loves to show the kind of uh, muscularity and physicality of the medium. Um, and he was often photographed without his shirt. Uh, and he did have a kind of gaggle of admirers, but he's largely training men, and he's not so interested in training women, uh, and he creates what is ultimately a really female unfriendly environment for students, and he ends up having a lot of buddies um, who he helps train, among them Paul Soldner and Ken Price, and they work late into the night, and supposedly they take a lot of amphetamines together so that they can stay up all night, uh, and they create a big party scene that becomes sort of nationally known, um, and part of this has to do with the fact that he's decided that he's gonna work as big as possible. He does not want to make the little terrines uh, these delicate terrines. He won a first prize in a national competition for this little terrine from 1954 right out of school. This is too feminine and delicate for him. Instead, he wants to do these huge stoneware pieces at the size of 60 inches, five feet tall, as a way to really think sculpturally. So he brings sculptural thinking to the medium, which is great because it gets out of the realm of the functional or the delicate, but with that, it becomes this gendered problem in which women become associated with the small functional works, um, and men become associated with muscular sculpture. And that becomes the difficulty um, in the 50s of trying to sort out the gender politics around Peter Volkus and his coterie of all male um, artists who just worship him. Uh, Volkus hadn't been seen, um, for as famous as he is in the ceramics world, he had not been seen um, in the form of a retrospective since 1979. Um, and the Museum of Art and Design curated one in 2017 that travels to the Renwick um, and gets a lot of press. So it's the first time that all of this stuff has actually come back out from storage um, over a long period of time. It never helped things that Volkus himself decided he was too cool for ceramics. Um, he gets fired uh, at Otis by Millard Sheets and he has to go get a different job and he goes to Berkeley and he gives up ceramics altogether uh, for a period of about 15 years through the 70s, and he only works in copper and in metal. And he tries to make these big, hulking metal things that everybody thinks are kind of awful. Um, and for that reason, they don't ever appear in this retrospective. Uh, the retrospective is confined to his so-called breakthrough years from about 54 to about 64. They also include some um, abstract expressionist-esque painting that he dabbles in. Um, and John Copeland's, who is um, one of the founders of Art Forum magazine um, and is a director for a while at the Pasadena Art Museum, proclaims these large-scale pieces abstract expressionist ceramics in 1959. And Peter Volkus could not be more pleased to be associated with the abstract expressionists. Um, and so that is the work that he becomes best known for, are these sort of deconstructed pots um, objects that are much more sculptural. He stops throwing on the wheel for a lot of his work and he does slab work, which is putting big things together um, and you know in big slabs so that you could get big pieces like this. Again, in ceramics, the delicate balance is, is that if you get a kiln big enough to fire something like this, if it's solid, it will explode. Um, these things have to be hollow, and so there is an engineer, a feat of engineering in making hollow parts to these, or in building them and settling pieces on top of each other, um, because many, many things explode in kilns all the time. Um, and, and that is also the sort of process orientation of the medium, is, is that many ceramic artists never become too attached to the work that they put in the kiln because they know that there's a high possibility that they're not gonna get it out. 
um, at the end of the day. So here's another couple images. And also just to show you once again that the performativity of Volkos is that he demonstrates widely. Uh, this is something called a mud festival that they come up with at Penn State. He's on a stage in a theater building this massive piece that he's got his arm all the way down. Um, and that would have been quite amazing to see as a student in any period of time, is to see somebody make something um, that is just you know, amazingly solid and great and hollow at the same time, and to build that big, people get excited to see big things, um, especially if you're used to seeing very small things. Um, so I did mention Ken Price briefly, um, and this is just to show you Ken Price um, died about um, six or seven years ago. Um, he's the artist who in his sort of afterlife, or the legacy of Ken Price is that he became what Volkus wished he could be. Volkus never wanted to really be associated with ceramics. It was okay to be an abstract expressionist ceramicist, but ultimately he wanted to be a sculptor and he wanted to be recognized for making a sculpture. And Ken Price, even though he stays within the medium of ceramics, these become sellable objects um, that people love and don't ask him how they're made anymore. And they somehow escape the relationship of being called or configured as ceramics because they're like blobs and they have bright colors. And he's painting on these instead of using glaze chemistries in order to orchestrate the kind of um, color effects that he wants at the end of the day. He's basically eschewed ceramics and said, I don't need that traditional stuff. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to make these sculptural forms. And ultimately ends up with a big, large-scale retrospective right before he dies at LACMA um, that's very popular and travels. Um, and so it's interesting that Price really becomes the inheritor of Volkus's own vision for himself that he might have wanted, but that, that Price ends up getting. Um, in some way. And even today, Price is the one who commands the highest commercial prices. Um, he has the biggest blue chip galleries. He should, his, his estate is with Matthew Mark's gallery. Um, and pretty much every major contemporary museum has a Ken Price now in their collection. And it's no longer really classified as ceramics. It's, classif it's not classified as decorative arts. It's really entered the pantheon of sculpture. Um, and so that becomes sort of an interesting problem um, that I think is kind of fascinating. Um, Brian Rochefort studied at RISD, um, and his teacher there uh, is actually a painter named Katie Schimmert, who does make objects. This is a lead crystal work that she made. But she had um, her earliest beginnings here at UCSB, actually. Um, in the late 80s, she spent a couple of years teaching um, after Michael Arndt's retired, uh, and she loved being in Santa Barbara, and she told me uh, when I was at RISD a few years ago that she would have stayed forever, but there, they never made a job for her, uh, because they discontinued the ceramics program here. Uh, so I just wanted to sort of point out in a more contemporary way that um, artists are crisscrossing media now like never before, and no longer do you have to commit to being just a ceramic sculpture, sculptor, you can be you know, somebody who works in lead crystal, you can be somebody who paints, you can do all of it together. And so the media hierarchies have really exploded now and are not so, people aren't so beholden to them. Um, on the other hand, there are people still making really large scale ceramics and that has to do with this ongoing legacy of seeing how big Volkos could make his work. Um, it really ignited people. So this is just to show you um, an interior view of Annabeth Rosen's studio. Annabeth <coughs> Rosen um, is one of two remaining uh, ceramic artists in the UC system. Every UC got rid of ceramics. It all went, uh, there's always been ceramics at community colleges and at Cal States. Um, but she teaches at Davis um, and she makes objects by accumulation. So she makes tons of the same thing and then builds her objects. Um, here's a, a really small bundle that I happen to love um, that you can see is about accumulated objects that almost look like shells in netting. I think it's quite beautiful. But she makes bigger things too. Um, and she uses 
baling wire and steel frames and casters and is making multimedia fired ceramic work, not just simply straightforward ceramic work. And what you see here in the back of her studio is that she's also doing a lot of preliminary or ongoing process-based drawings that have a direct relationship to the forms that she's engaged in building. Um, another artist uh, who studied at Davis, but uh, was kind of the last artist who got to study with Robert Arneson, who I'm not going to show you tonight, but is a famous pop ceramic artist, um, is Kathy Butterly, who's based in New York, but I think that these look um, and have the kind of dimensionality and crushed objectness of Brian Rochefort. They're on a much smaller, i.e. feminine scale. They're about five um, you know, between five and ten inches. They're almost like cups, but you can't use them. Um, and they're always um, about the kind of texture of the surface in which she's got crackle glazes and then smooth surfaces simultaneously woven within the same piece um, in order to get the multiplicity of the interior and the exterior and the idea of the interior and the exterior coming together or merging in such a way that you don't know which is which because it's got that kind of crushed down look and it's, it becomes about um, an endless ongoing surface or body that is related in some way both to process but also maybe to the body itself about the interior and the exterior world. So here's um, an installation shot uh, at Moore College of Art from 2013 just so you can see um, the sense of how these still maintain the integrity of the vessel. Um, but also work like here with the plinth, that in fact ceramics work has to be viewed at eye level for the most part for um, people to view it, and that it becomes sculptural in its very essence in terms of how it becomes installed. Um, and that if you don't get to eye level with works this small, you lose the integrity of the piece, and nobody obviously is gonna kneel down. Um, on the floor, and you can't install it on the floor, but just to think sculpturally about what it means to work in this medium in which it's hard to build at the size or scale of um, Vulcus, where this would be, you know, bigger than human scale, and in fact, everything ultimately becomes a largely human scale. Um, so we'll, I'll end there, and I'd love to open this up and have more of a discussion or questions or comments. I know many of you are makers in the room, um, so uh, there's a sense in which I'm not telling you anything you don't know already intuitively <laughs> or even, you know, in a, in a non-intuitive way, in an actual way. So um, I'm happy to, to engage in a, more of a conversation if that's useful to anyone. sort of made a big splash. It's about every decade. Um, I think Rochford will have an amazing career. I think many people will look at this and say, I didn't know you could make ceramics in these colors. Um, and you know, he's working out of this ongoing continuum of people making volcanic, you know, explosive glaze chemistries, um, working with tactility in the surface. I think the work is beautiful. I mean, I really do think it's beautiful. I just don't think he's doing anything terribly new. I think he's working in a continuum. And I think that that's what becomes really important for me to establish as somebody working as a historian is, is that there's all these other people that precede him. They might have done things that look more traditional because they were working in the 30s and the 40s, but they were thinking in asymmetrical ways. They were thinking about process. They just happened to use traditional forms in a way that you don't have to anymore. 
that's a really good point. several men who became more famous in other media. J.B. Blunk um, is a, was a, a Bay Area sculptor who made large-scale wood, wood sculpture. Um, Bernard Kester was also her student, and he um, uh, went on to do, he studied, he taught fiber at UCLA for many years, but they both, they gravitated to other media. Um, at this time and even today, uh, it's historically that women are like 75% of all art studio art programs in terms of the undergrad enrollment, and yet it's usually the men who kind of rise to the top in terms of going on um, to have more uh, well-known professional careers. And at the time, at mid-century, part of this has to do with the GI Bill um, and the gendering of the GI Bill. So. Many working class men could never have afforded to go to college, let alone graduate school, without GI Bill money. Volkus was from a poor immigrant family. Rudy Audio, his friend, same thing. Not an immigrant family, but um, the way they got to school was on the GI Bill. And women, um, even those who had served the war effort, didn't have access to that funding. And so that becomes a leveling device in which women, with their undergraduate art degrees, get pointed to um, teacher training, community workshops, um, community college uh, teaching gigs sometimes, but usually secondary school. It's the sort of phenomenon of women become teachers. They don't need advanced degrees to do that. And for a large part of the century, you didn't need an, you know, an MA to have a teaching credential. Now people get MAs to teach. but. Um, that becomes the problem of getting women into the higher education system as teachers because they end up not having MFAs. Um, they end up teaching in the secondary school systems. Um, and it's only a few of them that go on to the MFA and sort of persevere, often in very unfriendly circumstances. Um, and part of the beauty of ceramics and textiles to some degree as well, mostly textiles, but was the fact that the, these were departments that were more open to women because they were absolutely closed out of painting and sculpture. It was really hard to be a woman in the 40s and 50s in a painting or sculpture department. Um, and that's something that Judy Chicago writes extensively about in her autobiography as a woman artist um, through the flower uh, that's published in 71. She's a UCLA sculpture student during the 60s and she toughs it out and she has to act like the boys and that's how she starts doing um, pyrotechnic work and doing those beautiful light works. That's how she ends up painting and using auto body works is because she has to compete and show how macho she is so she goes and takes auto body classes and she takes a pyrotechnic class to learn these so-called masculine disciplines in which she can make work at that same scale. So, so then what is the percentage of like, when you're talking about like master's programs at this point? Like what does that trajectory look like? Well and now master's now? programs, now MFA programs are mostly still so women. women. But, um, <laughs> but I think that the climb still is not 50-50 in terms of the, the artists who become recognized on the other side of their degree. I, I just don't think there's gender parity. Um, and I think that also there's a lack of gender parity in the museum world as well, which is that it's many, many women who work in nonprofits, who run museum education, who are curators, and yet they don't necessarily always have full control of their own programming. Um, and there's a top-down hierarchy in terms of the director leader role is still very male. So we still have a gender problem. Jenny. Hi. For lack of better words, I really want to know like the origins of your love story of ceramics, so to speak. Like how did you get introduced and all of that fun stuff? Um, honestly, I would say I fell into it uh, and 
I was a fiber student at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, I learned how to weave as an undergrad. I really loved the history of the fiber media. Uh, I was introduced sort of to the history of women at mid-century through the women I was studying with. And when I got to graduate school um, in a very canonical department at Yale, I realized that nobody was teaching me the modernist history I knew. I, I knew this history of mid-century fiber and a little bit about some of the crafts in other fields, but I was learning about like Jean Arp and Marcel Duchamp and like very traditional Eurocentric white male artists that I had no interest in. Um, and I felt like I wanted to do something different and that I had to kind of fight to figure out what that path might look like. And um, Wilden Hain became my conduit to that because she had this illustrious Bauhaus training. And so I was in a class that looked at uh, color and form and I insisted I write a paper on her and the Weimar Bauhaus and that's sort of where it all started. So the, you know, the professor at the time said, okay, fine, I'm gonna let you not write about painting or Joseph Albers, but you know, don't you wanna work on Ani Albers? And I said, not right now, but like, <laughs> And now there's been a big revival of Ani Albers too. And that's, I think, an important thing to know that, you know, even though she has to be dead to get recognition, she's finally more famous than her husband. It's also like that with Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo. Frida is finally like free of Diego. Even though in her lifetime she wasn't, she's the more famous artist. It gives me great pleasure. <laughs> George, you were first. Uh. Uh, is Southern California unique to being this sort of like, hub or there, like you know, geographic like, hot spot for ceramics in this kind of greater context? Like, does it spur from Marguerite Wildenhain? Or... Uh, Marguerite Wildenhain was in Northern California. She didn't spend any time in Southern California, but. Um... The other big hub and the major training ground that people still go east for is Alfred University, which is in upstate New York. It's in a small town called Alfred, New York, um, and it, it has the most historic and longest um, ceramics program in the country. And it was founded also by British immigrants who start a program there at the turn of the century, maybe about somewhere around 1909. Um, and there's an arts and crafts community in Western New York, and so there's a long connection between um, early ceramics and art deco and arts and crafts forms of making um, that does migrate to California, but usually in architecture. So like Green and Green in Pasadena, um, there's all kinds of beautiful ceramic objects that were in that home originally. I don't know if they're still there, but there, there is a history of arts and crafts making in this region. Um, but yes, Southern California has been a hub for most of the 20th century. I mean, it, and it's exciting to be in Southern California. And I think also, you know, it's the weather. Like, people want to be here. They don't want to be in Alfred, New York. It's freezing there. <laughs> Sarah. Thank you, Jenny, for your talk. Uh, I have a question about the future of ceramics, which could be really annoying for an art historian to answer anyways. Uh, it's really trendy now to create these abstract object sculptures where the artist is obviously showing what they can do with these fantastic glazes. And it's really great to see. And then there is a lot of, I'm looking at the slide you have up, there's a huge tradition of figurative work in ceramics in California as well, um, which is not so trendy right now. And then there are a lot of artists who are incorporating other materials into their ceramics that are also um, a part of this kind of tradition that's going on. So with the uh, ceramics programs that are diminishing now in universities, where do you kind of see this field going? Um, I don't know that I want to make predictions, but I do think that you brought up a lot of important points. There is a figurative tradition. Most people don't, you know, they associate figurative traditions with like, tchotchke figurines um, that they don't want a relation, you know, professional artists don't want that relationship. Um, there's a history of amateurism in craft and in the therapeutic in craft and um, also the democracy of craft, which is one of my favorite aspects of it, is, is that anybody can come to craft and learn to do skilled labor. Uh, and I think that that becomes the, the real thing is skilled versus unskilled and the kind of unskilled training that's being pushed at 
professional artists who undertake MFAs and that it becomes incredibly hard to learn how to make things anymore in art school. Um, it's a kind of strange thing. Uh, there's like, you know, usually one guy in a wood shop who's kind of grizzled and maybe there's a guy in the metal shop and they will reluctantly teach young students how to do the things that you have to learn to do, but it's hard to learn that stuff now. Um, and, you know, they're usually sculptors on the side um, who, you know, they, they need access to the shop and so they've kept those jobs. But, uh, and there's also a whole labor thing that goes on in ceramics too, where people graduate into shop positions and become the ceramic technical assistant to particular programs because they're attached to the equipment and they can't get away from and can't afford to find property, build their own kiln, start their own studio. They're never going to have access to scale and you know equipment 24 hours and they become very attached to the program from which they graduated and then they become technical experts who then you know mix all the glazes and mix all the, the you know the the chemicals or whatever and that's what people used to do in dark rooms too so i think that this is a this has to do with skill i think in art schools and who's skilled and who's not um and what skill gets you and i don't know i think it's a bigger question i, I don't know that i have an exact answer for you it's a it's a big can of worms but um i think that the people will eventually come around and demand skill from art programs again that's what i'm waiting for i'm waiting for students to want and demand skill and it will have to come at the private schools first because they're the ones who listen to the students because they're paying the highest tuition and if students at cal arts decide at some point that they need to have you know weaving i'm sure somebody will bring in a loom for them at some point i mean i you know i'd be very happy to see that happen but it, it will have to start there i think somebody else is it Rose? You had your hand up. Um, yeah, you mentioned uh, color as you know, a striking characteristic here, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about like tradition and conceptual meaning of ceramic color and ceramics. Yes. Um, so ceramics in the '60s, the '50s and the '60s was really um, sort of earth tones and. Um, people thought that Beatrice Wood was incredibly garish and in poor taste because she was making things that looked like metal but were out of ceramics. And so the idea was that she was doing this thing that was totally tasteless and brash because why would you want to make a metal chalice in ceramics? Why wouldn't you just make something that looked of the earth? And so there was like a real push toward muddy colors and beiges and um, uh, you know, if you think about like the bohemian cafes with like earthenware brown mugs, that that's sort of the quintessential brown coffee mug. Um, and she was making these bright things and people didn't like them. But uh, and one of the people who didn't like them was actually, you know, my buddy, Marguerite Wildenhain. Uh, Wildenhain was incredibly conservative and she thought that you should not make anything in a bright color because if you made things in bright colors, people can't eat off of it. Um, and she did want some of her work to be functional, but she was always working in this kind of um, bland palette um, of uh, traditional colors. Um, and again, that just has to do with the glaze chemistries that were available to her at the time um, in the middle of the you know, 50s and 60s. Uh, and the kinds of um, things she had access to. But uh, I think it's a, I don't know that much about glaze chemistry, I have to be honest, I'm not much of a chemist. I don't, I don't quite understand how these mixes happen, but they're also really toxic. Um, and you have to mix, they're all powdered, which is why I showed you that picture of the glaze chemistries. And you have to now mix with a respirator on so that you don't inhale these chemicals. Um, one of the things potters have historically died of is like silica lung, is inhaling particles of um, clay dust. And so there's the idea that maybe you should be using a respirator all the time, but certainly people don't um, when they're working with clay, when it's wet, but when it's dry, it actually is kind of toxic and you can inhale a lot of clay dust. And so the glaze chemistries themselves are also highly toxic. And so this is a medium which has a lot of, um, I think, chemical repercussions, I would say, for people. 
kind of like cadmium, what is that cadmium red that people don't use anymore, but it's a really beautiful color. Do people use it? Okay, they use it, see? <laughs> they use it with a band. Okay, are we at, at a good stopping point? Okay, thank you all.